holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. How many of you know where your birth certificate is? Oh, good. That is so good. <laughs> because life can be really hard if you've lost or if you've misplaced your birth certificate. Lynn Curtis, who heads up the Spirit of Hope Homeless Shelter that we participate in, has learned what a difference it can make to the men in the shelter if she can get them copies of their legal documents like their birth certificates. This year she started making that a priority. In the first week that a man would come into the shelter, she takes the time to sit with him and work with him to make sure that he has a copy of his birth certificate. And this new approach has brought some remarkable outcomes. She says it's a distinct difference from previous years. This year, many of the men have been able to get jobs within those first few weeks of entering the shelter. And now as the spring approaches, the majority of the men in the shelter are working. They've had these jobs long enough that they are looking for housing, that they are getting vehicles, that they are getting reunited with their families. Birth certificates are necessary for many things. Necessary for getting your driver's license or an ID, for applying for Social Security and other assistance benefits, their proof of citizenship for getting a job, many things. But the one thing you do not need your birth certificate for is to actually prove that you've been born. Because here you are, living, breathing, human beings, obviously, you were born. You yourself are proof. You don't need a birth certificate for that. Nicodemus's encounter with Jesus got him into a very confusing discussion about physical birth and spiritual birth and the proof of such birth. Nicodemus was a Jew. And among the Jews, he's a member of the Pharisee sect, which meant that he had taken a pledge in front of three other men that he would dedicate his life to observing every detail of the scribal law. The scribes worked out the regulations and the Pharisees committed themselves to following those regulations to the nth degree. And not only that, but to making sure that others followed those rules and regulations and that no one led the people of God astray to false teachings. Nicodemus was also a leader, which meant that among the Pharisees, he was one of 70 men who sat on the Sanhedrin jury. is sort of like the Supreme Court for the Jews. And one of the things that qualified Nicodemus to be in his position of leadership were the details of his birth, his family tree, his, his birth certificate, if you will. Being born into the right family was the way into God's family. That's why the Bible contains all those genealogies. There was a way for Gentiles to convert and to become Jews. But the Jews did not have any concept of conversion for themselves. So this talk about God starting a new family, a new kingdom, in which your ordinary birth wasn't enough, and you needed to be born again, or born anew, or born from above, would have been very confusing for Nicodemus. That idea of being born again is not nearly as confusing for us today, because it's a term that's used often enough in churches or in evangelism, and it usually means that a person has made a commitment to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that you have prayed a prayer that asks God to take charge of your life, and that you've enacted that commitment and that prayer, perhaps in baptism or in confirmation, and in to beginning to participate in the life of a church and take uh, communion. 
So a baptism certificate becomes kind of like a birth certificate that proves that new birth happened. And like a, a birth certificate, a baptism certificate can be important, like if you want to join a church. However, most of the time, you don't go around waving your baptism certificate in the air or reliving the moment of that rebirth. What really matters isn't that you can prove when and where that rebirth happened. What really matters is that you are alive right now. And the best proof is the living proof. The living, breathing, and in the New Testament that word breath is the same as spirit, so a living, breathing, spirit-transformed life. And yet, even though we have a better idea about what Jesus was talking about when he talked about being born again. We still find so much that was part of that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus confusing. So we're going to back up for just a minute and begin to look at some of the circumstances of that encounter. We're right near the beginning of John's Gospel. This is taken from John chapter 3. And John begins his book with images of light and darkness. And he introduces this theme that's going to tie together the whole story of Jesus. He says about Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Closely associated with that idea of light and darkness for John is the ability to see or to not see. Blindness and sight correspond for him with unbelief and belief. In that first chapter, then John goes on to introduce, John, John the Gospel writer introduces John the Baptist. And then some of John the Baptist's disciples become Jesus' disciples. As we move into chapter 2, Jesus does the first miracle of turning water into wine for a wedding reception. He begins by showing to show his spiritual authority by going into the temple and clearing out all the money grubbers and then do performing more miracles. So by the end of chapter 2, lots of people in Jerusalem have heard about Jesus and they've seen his miracles and they're putting their faith in him. Nicodemus is one of the many people in the city who had noticed Jesus and had been impressed. So he decided to check him out. And my sense is that Nicodemus, as a person who in his desire to be faithful, had been following a rigid set of religious rules. My sense is that he had found that following the rules had really not satisfied those longings in his heart to encounter God. That he was hungry for a deeper experience of God than just keeping the rules and going through the motions. And so Nicodemus comes seeking an encounter with God and to be in God's presence by coming to meet with a person who he is sure has come from God. In verse 2 of that reading, Nicodemus says to Jesus, No one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. John also mentions another interesting detail in that verse, and that Nicodemus came at night, late at night, well after dark. And that detail has led to lots of wondering. Wondering if the men at that time perhaps needed to spend the daylight hours doing the work of providing for their families, tending the animals and the crops. And so maybe they came together at night to study the scriptures and to listen to teachers. Nicodemus, after all, does call Jesus rabbi, which means teacher. Or was Nicodemus afraid? Was he afraid of his fellow Pharisees who were already disapproving of Jesus? 
Was he worried about them causing trouble for him? Perhaps he was a secret disciple who needed to cover, come under the cover of darkness. Or was John, who just loved that imagery of light and darkness, trying to tell us that Nicodemus was in the dark spiritually? Nighttime was a time of unbelief and of ignorance and of blindness. And Nicodemus's confusion in that conversation that ensues tells me that there was no light bulb going on in his head. Nicodemus had come looking for God, which is why Jesus starts that conversation with a statement about being able to see God's kingdom, being able to see into that realm of God. He says, unless a person is born from above, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus doesn't get it. So Jesus tries again, saying the same thing, but in different words. He says, unless a person is born of water and the spirit, it is not possible to enter God's kingdom. Part of Nicodemus's confusion came from a word that had several different meanings. Anothen. It could mean over again, it could mean anew, it could mean from above or from the top. Even today, scholars are unsure which meaning for the word that Jesus intended. In our NIV Bibles that we have in our pews, it's translated born again. The Common English Bible uses born anew. The Revised Standard Version reads born from above. And maybe, maybe Jesus intended all of these meanings. He doesn't really clear up the confusion when he clarifies it by saying born of water and the spirit, because again, we're unsure what he meant. Was he referring to the water as the physical birth and spirit as the spiritual rebirth? Or was he referring to water as baptism? And then that corresponding infilling of the Holy Spirit into our lives that comes with that. What we do know is that all of these ideas about being born again and born anew and born from above or born in a spiritual way have to do with believing, with faith. Because as Jesus goes on talking with Nicodemus, he starts to talk about just that, about believing. And in the next six verses, he uses that word believing or faith. In Greek, it's the same word. He uses that six times in those next six verses. In John's Gospel, the word for belief or faith is always a verb, always. It's never a noun. It's never something you have like to have faith. It's not a thing you own. It's not something you possess. It's not a birth certificate or a baptism certificate. It's not a genealogy or a family tree. The word faith or believing is always a verb. It's something you do. It's something that can be observed and participated in. It's something for which the best proof is the living breathing, spirit-transformed, healed and hold and rescued life of the person who's doing faith. That whole analogy that Jesus makes between himself and the bronze snake, while strange and confusing in the middle of that passage, again is about living proof of an active faith. If a person believed and actively trusted God for healing, then the proof was as visible as someone who had been bitten by a poisonous snake, but was still alive. If the person who believes in Jesus, the proof is that visible, that new life apparent in front of our eyes. God's presence and God's kingdom is apparent in the community of faith that is animated and motivated with love and compassion. The most famous verse in the Bible, the most loved, the most cherished, 
comes right in the middle of Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, John 3.16. Often in modern Western Christianity, we have leaned towards using that verse as if we were talking about a birth certificate or a ticket into heaven. We use it at funerals or we use it in conversations that start, do you want to go to heaven after you die? And it's true, those words of Jesus are a great comfort and they offer a tremendous hope. And yet, if we let those words speak to us from the context of the conversation that Jesus was having with Nicodemus, it's about more than just this future hope that we wish for in the by and by. It's about a promise that's relevant for our lives today. If we truly invite God's Spirit each day to breathe that life into us and be born anew, born from above, then the proof is in the living, breathing, spirit-transformed lives that we live right now. That born-again faith is seen in the doing of our faith. And that comes out as love. The kind of love that God showed, as that verse says, when he gave his one and only Son to rescue the world so that it would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we believe that by following Jesus' commandment to love one another, that's our doing of our faith. But this verse goes even further than that, the extent to which Jesus was pointing us to comes out when we look at that word, the, the phrase, the world. In this verse, the word for the world is cosmos, and for the most part, that word was used as referring to the world that was opposed to God, that God-ignoring, God-hating, God-opposing world. For God so loved that world that he gave his one and only son, that that world would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we need to go on to the next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save that world through him. Those who believe in him, believe in Jesus, are those whose lives are evidenced by believing the doing of faith. They are living, breathing proof that love, in that reaching out in compassion to the world, to the whole world, to the enemies of God, to those God-opposing forces in our world. And so what happens next to Nicodemus? As a result of this encounter with Christ, does he ever figure out what Jesus is trying to say? Does he ever learn what Jesus is trying to teach him? It certainly didn't happen right away because Jesus goes on teaching in chapter 3, but Nicodemus is not mentioned again. But his name comes up twice more in John's Bible account. The next time we see Nicodemus is in chapter 7. And by this time, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders are really upset with Jesus and with his God-revealing acts. And they are wanting to, they're waiting to take his life, is what John writes. So when their plotting comes up in one of these Sanhedrin councils, Nicodemus hesitantly speaks up in Jesus' defense, and he says, Does our law condemn a man? without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? When the others in the jury respond back at Nicodemus with insults and with threats, Nicodemus shuts up. And we don't hear about him again for another 12 chapters 